Revelations chapter 3, Revelations chapter 3, we're going to look at the first six verses. We're talking about our fifth church and the Church of Asia series that we're discussing. Quick recap. I, I believe that the first three chapters when it deals with the churches of Asia, that all seven churches existed at the exact same time. Uh, when John on the Isle of Patmos wrote uh, this book of Revelations inspired by God, that all seven churches were in existence at that particular time in history. But I also believe that studying history and looking back, that you can find seven distinct church ages inside of the, these chapters as well. Starting with the Church of the Apostles of Ephesus. Uh, last week we discussed the Church of Thyatira Tyre during the Dark Ages. And tonight we're going to be discussing the Church of Sardis. Now, there are some good people that will be recognized in the Church of Sardis. However, for the most part, God had nothing good to say to her. As a matter of fact, if, I, if my recollection is correct, out of the seven churches, there are only two churches that God did not rebuke, and there are only two churches that God did not say they had any good thing going on for them. Sardis is one of those churches, Laodicea is the other one. So tonight we're going to be looking at the church of Sardis. So Revelations chapter 3, verse number 1 And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard And hold fast and repent, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what an hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, please help me this evening as I take this church and uh, try to discuss it and give them history, but yet make it applicable for our lives. I pray that you'll use the words that I say, the thoughts, that my thoughts would be your thoughts, that, we would, that I would just be a vessel that you use, and I pray that you'll give me wisdom, clarity of thought, and speech. I do pray that if there's anyone here under the sound of my voice that does not know you as their Savior, I do pray that they'll trust you before it's eternally too late. In Jesus' name, amen. What we've typically done while we looked at these seven churches, we have typically started off with the background, so I'll do the same this evening. Sardis was the capital city in an area of Lydia. It overlooked the Hermas Valley. It was positioned upon a high hill. It was about 50 miles east of Smyrna and about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira. Because it was set upon a hill, the people in Sardis felt safe and they felt secure. Although Sardis was a church that literally existed while John was on the Isle of Patmos, It is also the predominant church between the dates of A.D. 1500 and A.D. 1700. If you recall last week we were talking about the church of Thyatira. We were talking about the Dark Ages. The church of Thyatira, I believe, is the Roman Catholic church. The church of Thyatira was a predominant for a thousand years from basically uh, 500, A.D. 500 to A.D. 1500. That church spirit predominantly ran through the world. There were a few that uh, stood against it and there were a few that decided that they wouldn't go that way. But this church, this church of Thyatira, was predominant because of the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages brought forth the lack of education, the lack of understanding, 
Most of the people in the Dark Ages were illiterate. They couldn't read. Well, in 1440, right before this church age, 1500, in 1440, there, there came a great invention, a new invention. It was called the printing press. And the printing press allowed people to make copies of books quite easily. It sparked a, um, a resurge of education, and people started to learn again, and they started to read more. There was a fellow by the name of Martin Luther. You probably recognize that name. Martin Luther was a man that took a stand against the church of Thyatira, and there were other remnants that took a stand. For example, the Anabaptist. The Anabaptists were, was an affiliation that had no affiliation with the state, had no state control. And Martin Luther and other remnants started to speak out against the Church of Rome. Many of the people that took a stand against the Church of Rome or the Roman Catholic Church didn't want to separate from her. Martin Luther's desire when he, not, when he nailed the 95 Theses to the wall, uh, to the chapel door, was not to separate from the Roman Catholic Church. His desire was to reform the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't want to come out of the mother church. He wanted the mother church to get back to the Bible instead of making up its own doctrine. And so he nailed these 95 theses, these 95 things that he felt that the church needed to work on. Of course, that didn't go over too well. And we have this time where people were trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church. We would know that as the Reformation or the Reformation. And so now we have the church age of Reformation. We have the Reformation time period in history. And you have these men that are trying to... As a matter of fact, these people that were trying to reform the church also had to protest against the church. Now, we just talked about the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists were not state-controlled. They were not part of the Catholic Church ever. But they were taking a stand against wrong teaching. But these folks that came out of the Roman Catholic Church to reform her also was protesting against its teaching. And we would know that as Protestants or Protestants. You have your people like the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the a uh, whole bunch of them. I, could, I could, can't think of all their names right now, but these are Protestants. Now, I will tell you, a Baptist is not a Protestant. A Baptist has never been a part of the Roman Catholic Church. There was nothing to protest out of, and there was nothing to reform out of. They have never been a part of the Roman Catholic Church. There is a sect of group that was that way. For example, the Mennonites were never Protestant. Uh, the, the Amish people were never Protestants. The Baptists were never Protestants. And so you have this church in Sardis that is going to be known as the remnant church in a time period of reformation. And the whole purpose was so that they could come out. And they started a good work. They started to do something. But they never finished it. They kept falling short, according to the scriptures here. So, what were their deeds? Well, the Lord had no, com- uh, uh, no deed to commend her for. But he did tell her that he does know their work. And as I've said before, I'll say it again, I, I can't help but want us to realize that God knows our works. Over and over again, the church of Ephesus, I know thy works. The church of Smyrna, I know thy works. The church of Thyatira, the church of uh, uh, Pergamos, I know thy works. The church, the church of Thyatira, I know thy works. The church of Sardis, I know thy works. I want us to all realize that God knows our works. God knows our deeds. He knows when we pretend to be something that we are not. And the church of Sardis, evidently, was a church that pretended to be what it was not. Now, I am not saying that Protestant churches are the church of Sardis. I am saying that during these 200 years, the spirit 
that Sardis church brought forth was not necessarily all that it was cracked up to be. The church of Sardis was a church that didn't complete what she started. She pretended to be alive, and God says, you pretend to be alive, but I know that you're dead. Sometimes, sometimes churches, sometimes churches that we might hear of or watch on television or see, we say, ha, huh, they're alive. Look at how much fun they're having. I mean, they're dancing and, and they're doing this. It's like a, I've never been to a rock concert, but what people tell me that I've been to rock concerts, it's like, it's like a rock concert. I mean, they're up here sh- dancing for Jesus. I saw on the news or something just the other day that in Australia right now, they're having this big worship service. It's a huge, I don't know anything about it except that Justin Bieber was leading their worship music. I don't know much about Justin Bieber, but I doubt if he's a very moral song leader. But he's up there worshiping, and it looks like they're alive. But they're dead. It looks like they've got it all together. But inside, spiritually, they don't. Now, I'm not talking about any church. Any one particular church comes to my mind. What I'm talking about is the church of Sarda and the spirit of this church. They thought that they were alive, but God himself calls them dead. And so God rebukes them. The rebuke is pretty hard. God rebukes her for and challenges her. To be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. That is, the convictions and good desires that still remain in you. The things that you started to take a stand against. But you kind of stopped. It's kind of like someone starting a job and not finishing it and then going to another job and not finishing it. And you, probably most of our houses are that way because us men, we start this project well, we'll, get to, we'll finish it later, and then we'll start this project. And It's kind of like me and my books downstairs. I have probably 20, 25 books on my desk. I'll read this book. Okay, I'll read this book now. All right, I'll read a chapter out of it. And I just, I need to finish a book, right? And in this church of Sardis, they started something. And there was something in there that they could grasp one to and God said and God rebukes them and challenges them to be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that is the convictions and good desires that still remain because they're about to perish because the Holy Spirit is about to depart because the Holy Spirit is grieved he calls he he calls out and says their works not perfect according to the scripture this gives the idea of their works weren't complete Their works have not measured up to God's standards. They haven't completed that which God would have them complete. And they would start and not finish letting God work in them the way He desired was always falling short. They didn't meet God's standard. And so you have this church and this background and their deeds and the rebuke. And so the, the object tonight is how do we apply this to our life? Remember when I started six sermons ago in this series, I stood up here and I said, listen, Victory Baptist Church in Fairmont, West Virginia is going to have a spirit of one of these seven churches. We're not the church of Smyrna because we're not really being persecuted. And I don't want to be a church of Smyrna, to be honest with you. I like not being persecuted. We're not the fire tired church because it's obvious that we're, we're not Roman Catholic. Are we an Ephesus church that lost its first love? Are we a Pergamus church? Or are, we, are we a Sardis church? Are we a church that falls short of what God expects out of us? 
I certainly hope not. And then I say, what makes up a church? What makes up a church is individuals. And so we can look at the church as a whole and say, no, I don't think the spirit of Victory Baptist Church is Sardis. But then we can start looking at our own lives as individuals. Do we, as believers, fall short of what God expects us to do? Are we not complete? Are we not perfect in what He has for us to do? And I want us to examine our lives on that aspect because I want us to know if we have something in our hearts and our minds, I want us to do it for the Lord. We can never get away from the Scriptures. Some churches act like they're alive. We talked about this. And they have all this and that. They seem to be happy and joyful. They seem to be free. And in reality, they're dead. They don't preach the Word of God. They they won't tell people that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They, They won't tell people that they're sinners and that they need to have a Savior. They won't tell people that, hey, this kind of sin is wrong. This kind of sin is wrong. I was talking to some people yesterday, and we were just in communication about the judging, you know, judge not lest ye be judged. And the world has taken that terminology and twisted it for their own convenience. If a preacher gets up there and says, adultery is wrong, judge not lest ye be judged. Homosexuality is wrong, judge not lest ye be judged. Abortion is wrong, judge not lest ye be judged. But you have to understand, I'm not judging. I'm revealing a verdict. Adultery is a sin. I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what God said. Fornication is a sin. I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what God said. Abortion, murdering babies... Or murdering old people. Murder anyway is a sin. I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Now, I can't judge a person's motive. But I can certainly observe their actions. Maybe some of you do the, do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Is that possible? You teach Sunday school because it's just what you've done. And you're doing it, but you're not really doing it for the right reasons. You're just kind of stuck. You don't know how to get out. But you're doing it. You're, I don't sit there and judge their motives. I wonder why they're doing the Sunday school class. Are they trying to get on my good side? That would be judging motives. I can't judge motives. So, and, and, and I'm a person that... I guess in life I've I've become a little bit a little bit cynical and I'm trying to get I'm trying to be more optimistic I guess and so and sometimes and people do things for you and you're sitting there thinking what are they doing that for I'm judging their motives now Pastor Walls helped me with this a long time ago he says Nathan you can't judge people's motives if they do, we don't know why they do it I said okay. And I can't judge at all because I'm not the judge. I don't, have the ja- I don't have the gavel. But God is the judge. And, and all we are to do is declare the decree. And so the world takes the terminology and twists it to make it fit their immoral lifestyle. I don't want it to be a church like that. You know that on television there's a lot of televangelists that have church services that never bring up the idea of sin. It's always everything's great. God wants you to be a millionaire. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to have a bass boat. He wants you to have a Learjet. They never tell people that, hey, God wants you to be holy. Because that ain't going to bring a crowd. And so you have a group of people here You have a mentality of a church here 
that says, we're alive, look at us. And God says, you're dead. You're dead. Victory Baptist Church needs to stand with the Word of God and not the oncoming fads or fads that will fade away. These rocket out churches, my question is, what are they going to do next? See, it's a progress, it's, it's, a, it's a digression. They start here, and now they have to do something else to keep the attention of the group. So they bring in louder music and flashing lights. Well, they brought the louder music and flashing lights in, and every Sunday that gets a little boring. So what are you going to do next? What other thing are you going to produce now in order to keep your crowd? Because we have developed a church that wants to be entertained. Listen, I want you to love coming to church. I want you to love God. I want you to love God. I want you to come to church because you love God. I want you to love coming to church. I want you to leave Knowing that God loves you, that I want you to leave glad that you came and looking forward to coming again. But my sole purpose here is not to entertain you. If you came to church so that we can just, so you can just sit back and just be entertained, this is the wrong building. This is a church, not a movie house. A movie house is built to entertain. A church is built to teach and preach the Word of God. You know, these rocket out churches, I just don't know what they're going to do next. They have programmed their people to be entertained. They have, they have to one-up at every generation. But if the base of your church is on the Word of God and the doctrines of the Bible... You may not have the crowds, but you will have the truth. And see, and God looks down and says, You say you're alive, you're dead. Now, are all churches that way dead? I'm not saying that. I've not been in all churches. What I am saying is, there are a lot of churches that pretend to be alive, and God says, You're dead. Because life is not in what we produce. Life is what He produces. We can be an example and we can make a difference. But only through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can get up here and try to persuade you. I might even be able to wax eloquent. I can sit down and memorize a poem. I may even be able to memorize a script so that I could come in here. I could shoot myself out of the platform. I can act out scenes from Shakespeare. I can entertain you, but but you'll be missing something because it's not backed by the power of God. And I can speak to your ears. Ronald Reagan said this, Some people liked him and didn't like him. It doesn't really matter because what he said is true. He was called the great communicator and he said this. He goes, people have called me the great communicator. But I don't think that I'm a great communicator. I just think I communicate great things. And there is a difference. There are people that can wax eloquent, but they don't communicate anything. But if you have something to communicate, which is the Word of God, and if you do it in the power of the Lord, God's going to use you to do something. Let's not be a dead church. Let's not let people running down Morgantown Ave. Hey, I'm unfortunate. There's, There's a lot of churches that are just dead, dead. I mean, they don't even pretend to be alive anymore. I want to be a living church. I want. This is a living organism. This is something that God wants. This is His church. And I want it to be alive. And it's only going to be alive if we stick to the truths of the Word of God. We can think outside the box. 
We may not have to have our services in the exact sanctum order that you're used to. One of these days, I may throw a curveball at you and sing the handshaking song first. I don't want you to faint. It's not that I've compromised and I'm going liberal. You can think outside the box, but you can never think outside the book. And so it's important. It's important that we stand with the fundamentals of the Word of God and... Not start doing this because this is what can happen. Well, that church over there, they started three years ago and they're running 300 people. We've been here 43, 34 years and we're running 170. What are we doing wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Mountaineer Field will have 60,000 people the first opening game. You can, what I'm saying is you can draw a crowd. But I want to be alive. And as a spiritual, as a person, human being, I want to be alive. I don't want to stand up here and I want you to think, boy, Nathan Barker, he's got it together. He's alive. And then God looks at Nathan Barker and says, you're dead. You are such a hypocrite. You pretend and pretend and pretend, but you do not. And I don't want to be that Christian. And friend, no one can judge that except for God. But what I would suggest we do is self-examine our heart. Relook at why we do what we do. And are we doing it because... We love the Lord and we're alive. Or are we tr- pretending to be alive, but we're just going through all the motions and actions and we're dead? On a spiritual sense, there may be somebody in this room this evening that pretends to be saved, but you're dead. You're spiritually dead. Not dead in the sense that you, you're, you're saved and you're, you pretend to be a good Christian, but you really aren't a good Christian. You just put on a fake attitude. I mean, you know Jesus as you're saved. But I'm saying that you sit there and you pretend that you're going to heaven, but you are not going to heaven. You say, is that possible? Unfortunately, it is possible. What does the Bible say? Many in that day shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils? And the Lord's going to look at them and say what? Depart from me, ye ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. They pretended to be alive. And when the final judgment came, the great white throne judgment came, God looks at them and says, you pretended to be alive, but you are dead. And now you're dead for all eternity. And they're cast into the lake of fire. I don't want that to happen to you. You say, well, do you not want it to happen to me? Or, no, I don't want it to happen to me either, but it's not going to happen to me. Because 1 John five thirteen, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And friend, I know that I know that I know that I know where I'm going when I go. Because I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And if you've done the same thing, you don't have to worry about that either. It's those people that have been religious that are the ones that are hardest. They've come to church all their life. And they look back over their life. They don't ever remember a decision that they've ever made about accepting Jesus to be their Savior. And they're lost. They're lost. They want to go to heaven. And everybody does. Everybody in the right mind wants to go to heaven. But they're lost. See, God knows our works. God knows who we are even when we pretend to be someone else. God is not pleased with our works if they're not completed. And God expects us to watch. Hey, the, time, the times are changing daily, aren't they? I mean, every time you turn the news, I, I, was, I, I don't listen to the news a whole lot. Someone, someone the other day said, did you hear about North Korea? I mean, this is like three or four days ago. I said... Know what? They shot a missile. They did. Yeah, at us. Huh? It only went so many miles, but it could reach 
Alaska. That changed in one day. I didn't know that. But I, it was on the news when I went home and turned it on the Fox. Yep, there it was. Or CNN, don't matter. Well, not CNN. Not CNN. <laughs> <laughs> You know, hey, I, I just, I don't know, but the world's changing. I believe that this, these are the last days. I, I'm not a prophet. I can't tell you that, that the Lord's coming back in the next hour, five hours, five days, 16 days, 50 years. I don't know. But I do believe he's coming back. And I do believe that we need to be watching. We need to be watching for the snares of the devil. We need to be watching out for people that bring you spiritually down. We need to be watching out for opportunities that God had given us to serve. Have you, have you looked for opportunities to serve God? Sometimes <clears throat> we miss opportunities for one reason. Because we've, we, just don't, we just aren't watching. We just aren't looking. It's like driving down the interstate and missing your exit because you weren't paying attention. That happened to me once. My wife and I were traveling back from Daytona Beach, Florida with a van load of teenagers. This was several years ago. My wife said, honey, I'll drive. You can close your eyes and take a few minutes nap. I said, okay. We're driving up 75. And when I wake up, we were supposed to go through Florida, Georgia, and then Tennessee. But when I woke up, I see, I see Indiana. <laughs> see, my wife missed the exit. She'll blame me because I was asleep. But that was some time, that, that was a moment of intense fellowship. I missed the exit. Hey, she wasn't, paying, she wasn't watching for it. But how many times in spiritual life do we miss what God wants us to do just because we're not looking or watching? Opportunities all around us. I'll close with this. This is an exciting story for me because <clears throat> we, uh, those that teach Sunday school would know this. Our copy machine downstairs is done. It's, it's kicked the bucket. So for the last several weeks, our teachers haven't been able, a few weeks, haven't been able to make copies or anything. So I've been negotiating a deal with Canon trying to get a Canon copier in here and leasing it and whatever. It's needed. It's necessary. We need to get one. And um, I was trying to do my due diligence. I mean, I've talked to three different companies. I've called all the references. I've, I've talked to them over and over again. I've had them come in. Finally, the last day that I, I was making my decision, which I think was Thursday or Friday, Friday, the fellow came in and uh, made the decision pretty much to go with him. And he came in, and we started talking. We talked about coffee machines. We were in the library just sitting there talking. He's probably in his mid-50s. And I was just, uh, he says, he goes, what do you think? Do you think you want to buy the machine? I said, I'll tell you what. I said, let me pray about it. I said, because, I, you know, I have a responsibility for God's money. It's not a frivolous decision for me. And I, I just want to pray about it. Give me, give me, give me until four o'clock to pray about it. He stopped, and he stared at me for like what seemed like minutes, but probably was seconds. And he said, "I've never thought of that." I said, "Thought of what? To pray and ask God for wisdom on decisions such as this." I said, "Okay." Which there was an exit. There was an opportunity. And so for the next hour, we conversed in spiritual matters. He, he went to the Thyre Tire Church. And I just got done doing a huge study on the Church of Rome in Thyre Tire. And I started asking him questions. I said, What's, what about this? What about this? What about this? Do you believe the Bible? Yeah, yeah. And we just talked. I said, listen, I'm not trying to make you a Baptist, and you're not going to try to make me a Catholic. Let's just throw that out. I want to be a Biblicist. Let's talk about the Bible. What does the Bible say? 
That's really what catches my interest. I said, okay. So for the next hour, I was able to witness to that man. Tears running down his face. He got saved. Wow. It's an opportunity. And, and it just started by an accident. Let me, let, me, let me pray and ask God wisdom on the copy machine that we should get. Hey, friend, look for your opportunities. You have family members and friends. Hey, you, there are, listen, there are people out there that are religious. They think they're alive and they are dead, but they want to be alive. They just don't know how. And listen, he, he, he grew up in the church, and I, I went through the plan of salvation. I said, have you ever heard that? He says, I have never heard that. I, I mean, I love God, and, and I do. I, I, I love God. But here's a person that thought he loved God but was going to miss it because he wasn't taught the Bible. Opportunities. You have neighbors and friends that, that want to go to heaven. They want to go to heaven. And they even think they're going to go to heaven. They think they're alive. And God looks at them and says, you're dead. Why don't, why don't you... Here in a few minutes, do this for, for, for the Lord, not for me. Maybe for yourself. Why don't you, in the next, when the invitation starts, why don't you come and pray? And here's what I want you to ask God. God, give me an opportunity. Don't go and kick doors down, but give me an opportunity to open a conversation with and put the person's name in there that you want to see go to heaven the most right now. Give me an opportunity. Open the door. Maybe they'll call me because they've just really had a bad day. This guy had a bad day. He was just stressed out. You could tell. They had a bad day and they call me up. We're friends and they call me up and I don't know what to do. And boy, your opportunity. Hey, I want you to know it's going to be okay because God loves you. You realize that? Oh, I know he does. No, do you really know that God loves you? Well, yeah, I know God loves me. He loves you so much that he died for you. Well, yeah. And I love you too. Well, I'm glad. And sure, would love to know that you're going to go to heaven someday. Do you know that? Well, yeah, I know that. How do you know that? Well, I'm a pretty good person. Your door's been opened. You know, the Bible says nothing about being good to go to heaven. And if it did, it should have told us how good we had to be so we wouldn't miss it. If God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and good works takes me to heaven, then I expect that there should be a percentage, at least a percentage of how good I need to be in order to go if he's not willing that I should perish. I don't want to throw this to chance, but he doesn't. He tells me exactly what i got to do. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, maybe you're thinking you're going to heaven. And maybe you truly want to. But you think you're alive, but you're dead. I want you to know this evening, you could be alive. Jesus can save you from your sins. Jesus can save you and take you to heaven. So if you're here today and you're not saved, I hope you get saved. If you are saved, maybe there's somebody that God has laid upon your heart that you need to ask God to give you an opportunity this week that He'll open up a door and that you'll be wise enough to know when the opportunity is there for you to open a conversation and let them know that Jesus loves them and died for them and go through the plan of salvation. It's just as easy as conversing, having a conversation. Father, I love you. Thank you for your goodness. I pray that you'll help us today.